Eugene Debs, the anti-war speech in Canton, Ohio. Assalamu alaikum, Louisville. So, a little more history along the same line. In 1902, Pin Prince Henry paid a visit to this country to come to America. Prince Henry came to America. Do you remember him? I do. Exceedingly well. Prince Henry is the brother of Emperor Willem. Emperor Willem the Kaiser. It's World War One. So Prince Henry is another beast of Berlin. An autocrat, an aristocrat, a junker of junkers. Very much bought, despised by American patriots. Prince Henry came over here in 1902 as a representative of Kaiser Wilhelm. Wilhelm, or William. He was received by Congress and by several state legislatures. Among others, by the state legislature of Massachusetts. Then in session, he was invited there by the capitalist captains of that so-called Commonwealth. And when P Prince Henry arrived, there was one member of that body who kept his self-respect put on his hat. And as Henry, the prince, walked in, that member of the body walked out. And that was James F. Carey, the socialist member of that body. So James F. Carey is the only one in Massachusetts that walked the fuck out. And it's important to learn your heroes. Uh, Louisville and Massachusetts. So James F. Carey is a good Massachusettsian. So all the rest, all the rest of the representatives, though, in the Massachusetts legislature, all of them joined in doing honor in the most servile spirit to the high representative of the autocracy of Europe. And the only man who left that body was a socialist. And yet, and yet they have the hardihood to claim that they are fighting autocracy and that we are in the service of the German government. A little more history along the same line. I got a distinct recollection of it. It occurred 15 years ago when Prince Henry came here. All of our plutocracy, all of the wealthy representatives living along Fifth Avenue, all of them, threw their palace doors wide open and received Prince Henry with open arms, but they were not satisfied with this. They got down and groveled in the dust at his feet, our plutocracy, women and men alike vie with each other to lick the boots of Prince Henry, the brother and representative of the Beast of Berlin. They all loved Prince Henry. America was in love with Prince Henry, the brother of William, Kaiser William. And still our plutocracy, our junkers, would have us believe that all the junkers are confined in Germany. It's precisely because we refuse to believe this that they brand us as disloyalists. They want our eyes focused on the junkers in Berlin so that we will not see those within our own borders. I hate and I loathe, I despise junkers and junkerdom. I have no earthly use for the junkers of Germany and not one particle more use for the junkers in the United States. They tell us that we live in a great free republic, that our institutions are democratic, that we are a free and self-governing people. And this is too much even for a joke. But it is not a subject for levity. It is an exceedingly serious matter. To whom do the Wall Street junkers in our country marry their daughters? After they've wrung their countless millions from your sweet, your agony, from your sweat, your agony, and your life's blood, in a time of war as in a time of peace, they invest the, these untold millions in the purchase of titles of broken-down aristocrats, such as princes, dukes, counts, and other parasites in no accounts. Would they be as satisfied to wed their daughters to honest working men, to real Democrats? Oh no, they scour the markets of Europe for vampires who are titled and nothing else, and they swap their millions for the titles, so that matrimony with them become literally a matter of money. These are the gentry who are today wrapped in the American flag who shout their claim from the housetops that they're the only patriots, and who have their magnifying glasses in hand, scanning the country for evidence of disloyalty, eager to apply the brand of treason to the men who dare even whisper their opposition to junker rule in the United States. No wonder Sam Johnson, Sam Johnson declared that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. He must have had this Wall Street gentry in mind, or at least their prototypes, for in every age it has been the tyrant, the oppressor, and the exploiter who has wrapped himself in the cloak of patriotism or religion or both to deceive and overawe the people. They would have you believe that the Socialist Party consists in the main of disloyalists and traitors. It is true in a sense, not at all to their discredit. We frankly admit that we are disloyalists and traitors to the real traitors of this nation, to the gang that on the Pacific Coast are trying to hang Tom Mooney and Warren Billings in spite of their well-known innocence and the protest of practically the whole civilized world. I know Tom Mooney intimately as if he were my own brother. He is an absolute honest man. He is absolutely an honest man. He had no more to do with the crime 
with which he was charged for, for which he was convicted, than I had. And if he ought to go to the gallows, so ought I. He is guilty. He's guilty. Every man who belongs to a labor organization or to the Socialist Party is likewise guilty. And what is Tom Mooney guilty of? Well, I'll tell you what Tom Mooney is guilty of. I'm familiar with his record. For years he had been fighting bravely and without compromise the battles of the working class out on the Pacific coast. He refused to be bribed, and he could not be browbeaten. In spite of all attempts to intimidate him, he continued loyally in the service of the organized workers, and for this he became a marked man, the henchman of the powerful and corrupt corporations, concluding finally that he could not be bought or bribed or bullied, decided he must therefore be murdered. That is why Tom Mooney is today a life prisoner, and why he would have been hanged as a felon long ago, but for the worldwide protest of the working class. Let us review another bit of history. You remember Francis J. Henney, special investigator of the state of California, who was shot down in cold blood in the courtroom in San Francisco? It's Francis J. Henney. Francis J. H-E-N-E-Y. Shot down in cold blood in the courtroom of the San Francisco. Remember that dastardly crime, do you not? The United Railway is consisting of a lot of plutocrats and highbinders represented by the Chamber of Commerce. Absolutely control the city of San Francisco, the city was and is their private reservation. Their will is the supreme law. This is United Railways, fucking railroad corporations. Railroads have been Kentucky's enemy too. Railroads, coal, other monopolies. <laughs> Take your stand against them and question their authority and you are doomed. They do not hesitate a moment to plot murder and either crime to perpetuate the corrupt and enslaving regime. Tom Mooney was the chief representative. Of the working class, they could not control. They owned the railways. They control the great industries. They are the industrial masters and political rulers of the people. From their decision, there is no appeal. They are the autocrats of the Pacific Coast, as cruel and infamous as any that ever ruled in Germany or any other country in the old world. When their rule became so corrupt that at least a grand jury indicted them, they were placed on trial, and Francis J. Henney was selected to assist in their prosecution this gang, represented by the Chamber of Commerce. More like mangers and dommers, this gang of plutocrats, autocrats, and high binders has hired an assassin to shoot Henny down in the courtroom. Henny, however, happened to live through it, but that was not their fault. The same identical gang that hired the murderer to kill Henny also hired false witnesses to swear away the life of Tom Mooney and foiled in that. They kept him in a foul prison hole ever since. Tom Mooney, so free Tom Mooney, free Leonard Peltier, free Mumia Abu Jamal. Every solitary one of these aristocratic conspirators and would-be murderers claims to be arch patriot. Every one of them insists that war is being waged to make the world safe for democracy. And what humbug, what rot, what false pretense, what fucking horseshit. These autocrats, these tyrants, these red-handed robbers and murderers of patriots, while the men who have the courage to stand face to face with them speak the truth and fight for their exploited victims. They are the disloyalists and traitors. If this be true, I want to take my place side by side with the traitors in this fight. The other day they sentenced Kate Richards O'Hare to the penitentiary for five years. Think of sentencing a woman to the penitentiary simply for talking. The United States under plutocratic rules is the only country that would send a woman to prison for five years for exercising the right of free speech. Kate Richards O'Hare to penitentiary. Five years. Just for talking. And this be treason, let them make the most of it. Let me review a bit of history in connection with this case. I have known Kate Richards O'Hare intimately for 20 years. I'm familiar with the public record. Personally, I know her as if she were my own sister. All who knows Mrs. O'Hare know her to be a woman of unquestioned integrity. And they also know that she is a woman of unimpeachable loyalty to the socialist movement. When she went out to North Dakota to make her speech, followed by plainclothes men in the service of the government intent upon effecting her arrest and securing her prosecution and conviction, when she went out there, it was with the full knowledge on her part that sooner or later these detectives would accomplish their purpose. She made her speech, and that speech was deliberately misrepresented for the purpose of securing her conviction. The only testimony against her was that of a hired witness. And when the farmers and men and women who were in the audience she addressed when they went to Bismarck, where the trial was held to testify in her favor, 
to swear that she had not used the language she was charged with having used, the judge refused to allow them to go upon the stand. This would seem incredible to me if I had not had some experience of my own with federal courts. Who appoints our federal judges? The people? In all the history of the country, the working class have never named a federal judge. There are 121 of these judges, and every solitary one holds his position, his tenure, through the influence and power of corporate capital. The corporations and trusts dictate their appointment. And when they go to the bench, they go not to serve the people, but to serve the interests that place them and keep them where they are. Why, the other day, by a vote of 5-4, to four, kind of craps game, come 7, come 11, they declared the child labor law unconstitutional. <laughs> So the Supreme Court, the federal courts, in uh, 1918, so just less than 100 years ago, child labor was legal in the United States. And the Supreme Court said that the child labor law was unconstitutional. So, a law secured after 20 years of education and agitation on the parts of all kinds of people, and yet by a majority of one, the Supreme Court, a body of corporation lawyers, with, ju with just one exception, wiped that law from the statute books and this in our so-called democracy. So that way we continue to grind the flesh and blood and bones of puny little children into profits for the junkers of Wall Street. And this in a country that boasts of fighting to make the world safe for democracy. The history of this country is being written in the blood of the childhood of industrial lords have murdered. This history of this country is being written in the blood of the childhood. The industrial lords have murdered. These are not palatable truths to them. They do not like to hear them. And what is more, they do not want you to hear them. That is why they brand us as undesirable citizens and as disloyalists and traitors. If we were actual traitors, traitors to the people and to their welfare and progress, we would be regarded as eminently respectable citizens of the republic. We would hold high office, have princely incomes, and ride in limousines. And we'd be pointed out as the elect who have succeeded in life and honorable pursuit and worthy of emulation by the youth of the land. It's precisely because we are disloyal to the traitors that we are loyal to the people of this nation. Scott Nearing. Scott Nearing. You have heard of Scott Nearing. He is the greatest teacher in the United States. He was in the University of Pennsylvania until the Board of Trustees, consisting of great capitalists, captains of industry, found that he was teaching sound economics to the students in his classes. This sealed his fate in that institution. They sneeringly charged this as the same user, the same users, users, usurers, right, user, usurers, money changers, Pharisees, hypocrites, charged the Judean carpenter some 20 centuries ago. That he was a false teacher and that he was stirring up the people. The man of Galilee, the carpenter, the working man, who became the revolutionary agitator of his day, Jesus Christ, soon found himself to be an undesirable citizen in the eyes of the ruling knaves, and they had him crucified. And now their lineal descendants say of Scott Nearing, he is preaching false economics. We cannot crucify him as we did his elder brother, but we can deprive him of employment and so cut off his income and starve him to death or into submission. We will not only discharge him, but place his name upon the black list and make it impossible for him to earn a living. He is a dangerous man, for he is teaching the truth and opening the eyes of the people. And the truth, oh, the truth, has always been unpalatable and intolerable to the class who live out of the sweat and misery of the working class. Max Eastman had been indicted and his paper suppressed, just as the papers from which I have been connected have all been suppressed. Louisville. Louisville, there used to be 20 to 30 German newspapers before 1900. At the 20th of the century, at the turn of the century, there was 20 to 30 newspapers, German written newspapers. Now we got one English newspaper, and that's it. Well, maybe Leo Weekly and a couple websites. But so five, five, when we had 20 to 30. Most cities and towns only have one daily, and we only got the Courier Journal, which is a Confederate newspaper. Started. Maintained by Confederates from 1850s to today, for the last 150 years, Courier Journal has been peddling Confederate manifestos. Max Eastman, he had been indicted and his paper was suppressed, just as the papers that have been connected have all been suppressed. What a compliment they pay us. They are afraid that we may mislead you and contaminate you. You are their wards. They are your guardians, and they know what is best for you to read and hear and know. They are bound to see to it that our vicious doctrines do not reach your ears, and so in our great democracy, under our free institutions, they flatter our press by suppression, and they ignorantly imagine that they have silenced revolutionary propaganda in the United States. 
What an awful mistake they make for our benefit. As a matter of justice to them, we shall respond with resolutions of thanks and gratitude. Viva la revolucion, Louisville. Occupy, November 1st to the 6th, Days of Rage, Louisville, downtown Jefferson Square. Everybody, get out there. Be peaceful. Viva la revolucion, Louisville.